Obviously, the stage is set. I mean, we're right there. During this time, guess who's gonna show up? The Antichrist, you ever heard of him? There's been movies made about him. The Antichrist. All right, this guy will take on the mark, you know, 666, one world, you ever heard of that? Does that sound familiar? Government, one world currency, you can see everything moving toward that. He's the guy, you know, who's gonna come in and bring peace, then everything will hit the fan. It culminates with this ginormous war. The mother of all war. Sound effects mine. The tank, you know. I'm ADD, I have to do this to pay attention to myself. I'm serious. That's the Battle of Armageddon. That's the mother of all battles, and I've been right there with people in this church, in the area where it's gonna go down. It's like, whoa, this is freaky. And I got a little fearful, a little bit of fretful. Then I thought, why am I getting fearful and fretful? I should be encouraged because I've been enlightened, and that should be evangelistic. So now, what happens? Well, those of us who are in Christ, all right, we're with Jesus in the heavenlies. The tribulation has taken place. You'll love this. The mother of all battles has taken place. But, but let me just throw in one cool thing for you. Think about how chaotic our world is right now. You remove the Holy Spirit of God from this planet. You remove the church from this planet. Are you kidding me? It's gonna go wacko. Well, during this time, to show you how great our God is, he picks a race of people to be evangelists on steroids. Now, as you think about the people groups, who are the most tenacious, the most resilient, the most intelligent, the most blessed? Obviously, God's chosen people, the Jews. The Jews. Some of my best friends are Jews. Jews make the best Christians around, they have a great capacity for God. We have many here at Fellowship Church. Well, 144,000 Jewish evangelists will be doing the stuff during the tribulation. They will lead, it'll be very difficult, they will lead some to Christ during the tribulation. So now, all right, you tracking? We're back, boom. The second coming. Okay, the second coming. This is invisible, the rapture. This is visible. Jesus brings back you and me, all those you know in the church who've been raptured, boom, now we're back. Those here joined together. And it's stunning to see how things that were out of place are now back in place. Have you ever wondered why you have that desire for things to be in place? People say, everything has its place, everything has its place. And I'm not obsessive compulsive, but I'm a little bit obsessive compulsive, you know? And sometimes people come over to your house and they kind of move stuff around and you're like, man, that's out of place. Or you get in someone's car, and, oh, these things feel out of place, you know? Things that are out of place need to have their place. Well, when Jesus comes back, three things that are out of place will be put back in place. Number one, what's that? The church. The church, the bride and the bridegroom, the bridegroom being Jesus and the church, <laughs> joined together. Number two, something that's out of place that'll be put in place, the devil will be incarcerated, the criminal in prison. And number three, Jesus will be Christ will be on his throne. And I've got to stop right there. Now, this is very, very important. Stay with me. Do not zone out. A thousand years, a thousand years, remember that. That's a millennium. A thousand years, let me highlight that. Say a thousand with me. 
That's very, very, very important. Some respected theologians and biblical scholars would put the 1,000 years not there, they would put it there or there. Some would be pre-millennialist, others would be mid-millennialist, post-millennialist, ah-millennialist. You know what I am? I'm a pan-millennialist. I believe it'll all pan out in the end because <laughs> Because, this is very important, there is great debate over the exact chronological order of all of this to about right here. This is a great debate. And this is a non-essential, friends. What's the essential? The essential is the second coming. Jesus is coming back, that's an essential. And at Fellowship Church, I say this every time, I talk about membership at Fellowship Church. Listen to me very carefully, read my lips. In the essentials, we practice unity. What's the essential? The Bible is the word of God. Salvation by grace through faith. Baptism by immersion. Priesthood of the believer. Those are the essentials of the faith. A non-essential of the faith would be your eschatology. Your view of the final things. Some people just believe in the second coming of Jesus, the imminent second return of Christ. Boom, he's back, there we are. Others believe in all of this, and I happen to, to I think I believe in this, the rapture, you know, the seven year tribulation, I think we'll be taken out before it, and then the battle. Some people think we'll go through it, others think we'll be taken out right here in the middle. Who knows? But it's a non-essential. So in the essentials, we practice what? Unity. In the non-essentials, we practice charity. We got people who believe different things about this, good for you. But don't get so into the data at the end of the day that doesn't really matter that you forget it's about the second coming, you forget it's about the who and the you and what you're supposed to do. A non-essential of the faith would be dancing. Some people here at Fellowship Church, they, they dance. And if you wanna dance, that's a non-essential. Now, dirty dancing is a sin, Dancing is not, some people choose not to dance. Those with no rhythm, that's fine. <laughs> I'll tell you another non-essential. Alcohol consumption. Oh, let me make people nervous. Alcohol consumption. I can build a case for drinking in moderation from the scriptures. That's a non-essential. So this stuff here, boom, boom, non-essential. Here. Essential. Have you ever heard this before? People say, don't judge me. You're judging. Man, don't, don't, don't be judging me. I would love to do so long, but next time, I'm talking about something that very, very, very few churches ever talk about. It's one of the hottest topics in scripture. It's, it's, it's an essential of the faith. It's the judgment of God. Because in this, and this is an essential here, there's a judgment, a big, honking, gargantuan judgment that goes on. And we need to understand this whole judgment thing. My prayer for you is not to get caught up in all of the wins and the hows and the whys, but remember, here's the flow of it, Remember the who and the you and what you're supposed to do. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to have confidence as you live your life. We have hope beyond hope. We've got faith. We should have one eye on eternity, the other on the temporal. We've got to live that way. And when we do that, it's like the old hymn. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth, materialism, greed, pride, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When I struggle in those areas, I'm having my eyes too focused on matter, on the temporal, and not enough on the eternal. Now matter matters, yet there's gotta be the balance. When Jesus comes back, he's gonna draw those of us to himself. It'll happen here in the rapture, 
It'll happen during the second coming. Whenever I wear a sport coat like this, I get so angry. This is where I'm a little bit obsessive compulsive. When my collar gets kind of jacked up, you know? But look at this collar. Is this collar perfect? Just tell me, it's perfect, isn't it? It's perfect. Sometimes I've worn collars that aren't perfect, and I've like been speaking at a conference or whatever, and I'll be doing the whole thing like this. And people are like, you know? A friend of mine in Miami said, Ed, your collar's jacked up, man. You need something. And let me tell you what he did. I want to give you a fashion tip. You'll, you'll, you'll love this. Okay. Why is my collar perfect? Is it a great shirt? Shirt's good. But here's what's great. See that right there? You got it? Oh, is, is it that? You know what that is? A magnet. Check it out. You take the magnet off. Would you hold that for me? Sure. Thank you. And right here, guess what you got? A collar stay. Not one of those plastic ones that'll make you ah, fly away. Ah, no, no, no. Nothing like that. <laughs> Ladies, you ever seen your man like this? Okay, honey, let's go. You know what this is? It's a magnet. Check it out. Pink. A magnet. Pink. What does a magnet do? A magnet attracts itself to something like itself. Iron. Boom. You, you move this magnet over other stuff, it ain't gonna stick. You rub it over something like itself, boom. What's gonna happen right here? Jesus is the magnet. He's gonna move himself over humanity. And those of us who have a like nature, we are gonna be attracted to him, joined to him, and we can magnify him. Isn't that great news? That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So it should cause those of us who are in Christ to share this good news with others, to tug people along to fellowship church all the time, to share our story. Those of you who are still wondering about Christianity, man, think about those final things. Think about the past, the present, the future. Think about the fact that there are eight times more predictions for Christ's return than was his birth. Think about the fact that one out of every 30 verses in the New Testament is about the second coming of Jesus. When you do that, things will happen and you'll be ever ready for the ever after.